All right. So unit five on a page. So let's go through and basically unit five. Here it is. So what do we know? Well, we know way back from unit one that charge must be conserved. Right? We said that way back at the beginning. We got a problem on that in the very first homework. The amount of charge in the universe doesn't change. Because of that, the current must also be conserved. Why? Because what is current? Current is I sit here and I count how many electrons go past me in a second. Or how many sodium ions go past me in a second. I am just curious in how much charge goes past me in a second. That's what current is. Now, one thing that is true about our discussion of circuits, you get a bunch of weird units. So keeping all your units straight becomes really important. So current, if it's charge per second, um, then that's going to be Coulomb per second, and that's what an amp is. So you've heard about you know, 5 amps of electricity. That's what an amp is. 5 amps means 5 Coulombs per second, which is a lot. I think you need milliamps to kill you. So the one little really annoying feature about circuits is that the direction of current is, by convention, opposite the direction that the electrons actually move. This is Benjamin Franklin's fault. If any electrical engineer or any physicist ever invents a time machine, we're going to go back in time and slap Benjamin Franklin in the face and make him choose the other choice. So back in his day, he's, he didn't know about atoms, right? It's, it's the 18th century. He doesn't know. So he says, uh, current shall be the direction. He knows about positive and negative charges because he's, he's got the rods. He's got glass rods and amber rods and that sort of thing. So he says, I don't know what's moving in a current. I'm going to say it's the positive charges. And We've been stuck with that choice ever since. We're not going to go back and change 300 years of scientific literature. So, yeah. So what's going on in a wire? I know these pictures are small. That's so I could fit it all on a page. The electrons are kind of bouncing their way along. Like the, you know, these green circles are the atoms, right? There's still the nuclei in there. and They're bouncing their way along. So the electrons are moving this way. The convention that Benjamin Franklin has saddled us with is that current goes in the direction of positive charge. So opposite the direction of electrons. Now, if my current is sodium ions in a liquid, I'm good. For electrons, it's annoyingly backwards. We deal. OK? We deal. Um, the other thing we need to kn we know this is all just flows. This is all just consequences of the fact that charge must be conserved. Is however much charge comes in has to go back out. However much charge comes in has to go back out. Right? So here I've got three wires coming into an X. Whatever current comes in has to go back out. That's it. If they didn't, then the electrons would pile up here in the middle, which they don't. Okay? It's just like water. You know, whatever water comes into a pipe has to go out the other end. If I have a branch in the pipe, however much comes in one end goes back out the other. The amount of blood leaving your heart is the amount coming back in the other side. Second big idea. The change in potential around a closed loop is going to be zero. This is also something already you've seen from unit four. Remember this problem from your unit four homework? You saw that the work done going directly from A to C was the same as if I went A to B to C. Didn't matter. Furthermore, you, you actually calculated that the work done going all the way around is going to be zero. And we use this to justify that there is a potential energy. And we use this to justify that the change in potential is independent of how I go there. Potential around a closed loop is going to be zero. So 
there are a couple of different ways I can go up and down in potential. The first way is a battery. And what I'm showing over here are a bunch of diagrams, a bunch of common pictures that we have for drawing circuits. So we have a little symbol to help us. So the symbol for a battery is a long bar and a short bar. Make sure you make your bars up different lengths. All right, that's what a battery is. And the long bar represents the positive end. So if you've got a battery, the end with a little button on it, that's the positive end. The short bar represents the negative end, the, the, the flat end of a battery. Okay? And in a battery, the potential drop is fixed. Not the current, not the charge. The potential difference is fixed. The plus and the minus of a battery do not refer to charge. They refer to potential. So this is a AAA, and it is one and a half volts. All batteries say right on it what their voltage is, their potential difference. What does that mean? It means the potential here is one and a half volts higher than the potential here. That's what a battery is. Okay? Potential's fixed. The next thing I can have is a resistor. I can have a resistor. And a resistor is anything that converts electrical potential energy into something else, right? It could be heat, like an electric heater. It could be electric potential energy into motion, like a little motor. It could be light. It could be whatever. So pretty much everything is a resistor, because everything converts some potential energy into heat. You're a resistor. So next time you're in lab, I know your next two labs, you're probably going to have them. Take the, volt, take the uh, ohm meter, the thing that measures resistance, and hold it one, hand, one in each hand. It's fine. It won't hurt you. It's perfectly fine. And you can measure your own resistance. It's something like a kilo ohm, I think. So you have a resistance. And across a resistor, so the symbol for resistor is a little zigzag. Across a resistor, if this is the potential drop, then my current goes in the same direction. We'll see more about that in just a second. So I can have a resistor. And the units of resistor, the potential drop is this Ohm's law, V equals IR. There's a lot more about this in your prep. I actually prefer to think of it as I equals R over V, is how I prefer to think about it. And that's discussed in, I mean, V over R. That's discussed in your prep. But looking at it this way, we can see that the units of resistance are going to be volt per amp, which is called an ohm. So the units of resistance are called an ohm, capital omega. Some disciplines, different disciplines, different histories, all that kind of stuff. You know, we like to think of science as being this objective thing that exists. And yes, the law of conservation of energy is as close to objectively true as you will ever get. But which laws we look at and how they're formulated is dictated by history and all the social forces that impact that history. And sometimes different disciplines have gotten to the same idea with different histories. So they use slightly different terminology. All right? And this is impacted, this, this history impact is all across science. Makes you wonder if we had more people, what questions haven't been asked? If we had more diversity in science, maybe we would ask different questions, see different things. But anyway, different disciplines do different things. Some disciplines, instead of talking about resistance, talk about conductivity, which is just one over resistance. You can think of it this way. If, I have, if I'm more conductive, that means I'm less resistive, right? If I'm more resistive, I'm less conductive. So some people will talk about conductivity instead of resistance, basically the same thing. The other reason I like to talk about conductivity is because it has the best unit. The unit of conductivity 
is I am not making this up the mo, which you will notice is ohm backwards. And the symbol for the mo is an upside down omega. That is real. We started running out of cool names for things. All right, so some people do conductivity instead of resistance. Same idea. Um, one thing we will talk about is we will assume, unless told otherwise, unless explicitly told otherwise, the resistance of a wire is zero. This is not true. This is an approximation to the truth. But it is a really convenient approximation because in most situations, the resistance of the wire is tiny compared to everything else. Right? It's super tiny and compared to every other resistance in your circuit, so you just ignore it. All right? So in your case, most of your resistance is actually pretty much in your skin. Once you get inside your body, you're salt water, and you basically have no resistance. All right? Resistance is going to be fixed by the material. Resistance is going to be fixed by the material you've got. Different materials have different resistances. So in the case of you, this is how you measure body composition. You measure your resistance. Fat has a different resistance than muscle. So by measuring your total resistance, you can calculate a you know, body composition ratio, which is kind of cool. So it's fixed upon the material that you got. The other thing you can use to have changes in potential, have stairs, is a capacitor. And all a capacitor is, is a pair of parallel plates. That's all a capacitor is. We've talked about parallel plates, right? I've got over here the symbol for capacitor, I've got the charge, and I've got the potential drop. So for a capacitor, it's not the voltage that's fixed, it's the ratio of charge to voltage is a fixed number. That's the capacitance. More generically, a capacitor is two pieces of metal that don't touch. And this capacitance, the Q over V, is a property of whatever your, your conductors are. So in the case of a parallel plate, you've got the area, A, you've got the separation between them, D, and you've got the material in between, epsilon. All stuff we've seen. All stuff we've seen. So it's fixed by the geometry. The unit of capacitance, if we go and have a look, since capacitor is charge per volt, this, this has a name. It's called the Farad, after Michael Faraday, one of the best experimental physicists of all time. And we will talk more about him in unit six. So what do capacitors do? Well, we've got these two charges, right? They're separated. They want to be together. So they store energy. And then the last thing, the amount of power stored, dissipated, whatever, by a given circuit element is IV. You have to do this element by element. And this should make sense if you think about the units. Current is coulombs per second. Volt is joules per coulomb. Do the math you end up with joules per second, which is energy per time, which is a power. So that's it. That's unit five. Now all we do is apply that.